So my first question was, uh, did you know about any deaf community, deaf anything in this town before all this stuff started happening? Well, I was aware of the deaf community here. Um, obviously, uh, you know, with NTID and, and, and I mean, one of the really nice things I think about Rochester is that you see deaf people around. Uh, you know, you see them signing, whether you're at the public market or a restaurant or wherever you are, you're aware that there are a lot of deaf people in this community. Yeah. Okay. But you had not been privy to any sort of deaf uh, cultural events, entertainment, certainly not, not poetry, any of that stuff before. No, not at all. Not okay. at all. So how did it come about that you became aware of it? How did this all happen? Well, uh, what happened was when we moved to this building, which was in 1985, uh, from a place on South Clinton. We, we had a one-room storefront. We moved here in 1985, and suddenly we had three floors of space uh, and, and a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things. And um, so we started having a lot more poetry readings and, uh, and other events, and people, a lot of people found us. Uh, we would have an open mic uh, going on, uh, you know, on a monthly basis. So a lot of people would come to that, and uh, suddenly there was there was a real awareness in Rochester that there was uh, a place to go where you could have, you know, give a reading or, or listen to other poets or, or fiction writers. And so we had a lot of people coming. And, um, and one of those people, you know, was Jim Cohn. So, I mean, Jim was a kind of a real bridge between the two communities, uh, you know, uh, being a poet himself. Uh, and also being out at NTID, and, and Wendy Lowe also was a, was a person who was, uh, you know, a writer and a poet, and uh, out there too. So there there was, you know, a, a kind of a communication going on that people who were, uh, you know, who were writers, who were poets, and also out there in the deaf community knew that there was there was a way to kind of, you know, kind of get across this gap here and, and uh, mm -hmm. somehow get the two audiences together. So I think it was probably Jim, I don't remember exactly, but it was probably Jim who first uh, introduced me to, uh, to Kenny um, and to Peter. And at that time, there was also another woman who was, who was a part of it. Debbie Rennie. Debbie Rennie. So it was, um, you know, so it was, it was those two or three, and I, I don't remember the exact, but, but we, we did have, uh, and also there was Jazzberries, in which there was also kind of a cross thing, because people, which was a restaurant and also, you know, organic restaurant and, and uh, you know, healthy food and it was over on Monroe Avenue. And there was the stage there, so there was a lot of, of readings and, and performances and music, you know, jazz, jazzberries, and, and also, uh, you know, acoustic things. So there was things going on and I, and I don't remember the exact thing, but, but there was, um, you know, performances, some deaf things started to happen here. Um, and I remember at the time, you know, seeing this for the first time and thinking, wow, this is really, this is really unique. And, you know, in my position here, I mean, I, I you know, I, I saw poetry all over the country. I mean, I would go to places and, and you know, there would, I would see what was happening. It was at the same time that the, um, there was the beginning of the poetry slam, which was growing out of Chicago. And there was a lot of kind of, you know, interest in that. Well, suddenly, you know, poetry, could be done as a kind of Olympic style competitive event with judges, you know, like somebody would read a poem and they'd give them a, you know, 8.5, like, like you were watching, you know, gymnastics on TV. So there was some different kinds of things going on. There was, on the West Coast, there was kind of language poets that were kind of coming out of there. Uh, from New York City, there was a certain kind of, you know, outgrowth and follow up to the, to the beat poets. So there was things happening in different parts of the country, uh, which I was aware of. But seeing this, it really struck me that this is something very unique, not happening anywhere else, and you know, something that grew out of Rochester. Um, and I, I remember I mean, kind of seeing that, but I remember the first opportunity I really had to kind of present that to other people um, was um, we had a, a conference here in Rochester and we had people, it was a literary conference, we had people from all over the state, a lot of people from, from New York City and people from New York State Council on the Arts. And um, we had a dinner down at City Hall. And Kenny will remember this. And so uh, I decided that the, this would be a great opportunity to introduce all these people to something that was unique to Rochester. So when they came here, we said, okay, we're gonna introduce them when they had lunch. For instance, we had lunch in this building. We said, well, 
we're going to teach you how to eat White Hots, because, you know, White Hots are a, kind of a Rochester thing, you know. And we had Genesee beer, so we were kind of really kind of introducing them to Rochester. And so um, I said, you know, w when we have this dinner, uh, we'll have some local poets. And I remember people were coming and saying, oh, boy, we have to listen to local poets. You know, they were like, oh, boy, you know, they wanted to show us the local poets. And so I said, okay, you know, I introduced them. I said, you know, one of the great things about Rochester is that we have the highest per capita deaf population in the country here uh, as a result of NTIT. And people come here and they, you know, go to school, and then a lot of them stay here. So throughout Rochester, there are pe deaf people. You see them all the time. They're a really important, integral part of the community. And out of this has really grown a this really unique form of, of deaf poetry. And I said, what's really, I mean, it's unique in that American Sign Language is very beautiful to watch, and people may have seen that. But uh, there's also, in this case, there's a spoken, so that there's a voice which is being spoken. So you have two communities who can experience the same activity or event or poetry, but in a different way, obviously. Uh, although the people who are hearing can see the beauty of the sign language um, and, and the body movements and the people, and they, but they can also hear what's going on. And the deaf people experience poetry in their own language. And um, so they performed. And one of the people that was there was Gregory Kalavakis. And Gregory Kalavakis was head of the New York State Council on the Arts Literature Program. Just a wonderful, uh, wonderful person who ended up dying of AIDS, one of the first people I knew in terms of, uh, you know, who, who did die of AIDS. It was a great loss. But he immediately also saw that this was really a unique, wonderful thing. And afterwards, I know, came up to me and, and came up to, to, to Kenny and said, you know, we really want to do a lot more with this. We'd love to get you guys around the state. Uh, and, and out of that grew uh, really uh, you know, Flying Words project, being able to go out and reach an audience way beyond here. So, I mean, my first, my first, you know, contact with it was uh, immediately eye-opening um, and ear-opening at the same time, was that this is really, I mean, this is, this is really wonderful. It's unique. Uh, there's nothing else like this going on anywhere in the country. And, um, you know, it's something to celebrate and something to get out to a much wider community. Um, so that was, that was kind of the, you know, without remembering the exact details of the first performance, but I, you know, I think it was Jim that kind of introduced some things here. But I do remember very, very clearly being impressed and very clearly saying, okay, here's an opportunity to really expose them to a much lar larger audience um, through this conference that we had. Do you ha did you have any, first of all, is all this noise a problem with all the doors? No. Should we do something about it before we go on? I'm going to have a little check. Can I take a little check? Yeah, yeah. if you want to do that, and they're going to Okay. That was so great. <laughs> there were so many different things in what you just said. Did you have any awareness or did anybody explain to you the sort of adversarial relationship that deaf people had with the fact that even as, accepting the fact that ASL could be poetic? Like, did you know about that whole cultural linguistic thing that was happening that was the context for why that was so amazing? Like, no, actually, okay. had no idea at all. No idea. I mean, to me, it just seemed, I mean, the first time I said, you know, this is, <laughs> I mean, this is a beautiful expression of poetry, and it seemed to me a beautiful expression of the deaf language, ASL. Uh, no idea that there'd be any thoughts that there's, there's, there's no way that this could be used as a poetic form. Mm -hmm. Did you anybody know, explain it to you even later? Like no. It, nobody, this is the first you It's the heard first it. I've ever heard of it. <laughs> In brief, the reason why this is being made, or why I'm trying to make it, is because uh -huh. before that time, deaf people would, uh, they would translate English poetry, they would try to write English poetry. But because ASL wasn't considered a real language, even the deaf people thought that it was less than English. And, and English is based on sound and rhyme and rhythm and all this stuff mm -hmm. that we don't have that in our language. So poetry is English, and they'd read it and not get it because the convoluted way that English works is very linear. And yes. so why, the, the, the real reason why here in Rochester was even more amazing than you already knew. I mean, you uh -huh. knew it was. And the reason it was even more amazing is because what was happening here was people saying, I'm not going to translate English and I'm not going to write English, I'm going to generate it in ASL first because there are poetic forms, there are parallels, and Wendy's going to talk about this, that the, the rhythm and the wit and the rhyme and all that can be done in sign language, it's just done in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so there was this realization and experimentation that happened here 
and there were a couple other people doing it in other parts of the country, but it was it was fairly endemic to the Rochester area that this explosion was really happening. Mm -hmm. And so what you were intuiting was even more right than you knew, you know, that it was incredible, uh -huh. even amongst the deaf people. And some people were resistant. They had trouble with it. They looked at what that's this isn't poetry, it's something else, but it's not poetry because uh -huh. poetry is English. It's not ours. That's like it is yours and you're doing it yeah what you're doing is well you know it's interesting because that parallels so many other kinds of voices coming forward i mean there was a time when it was the same with women poets you know like poetry is the language of men i mean as seen by the men you know and the you know the woman's voice you know it should be in the home it should be about nurturing and raising children but it should not be about the world and so i mean in the you know, 50s and 60s, there was a whole, you know, women claiming their voices and, and you know, the, the establishment saying, you know, that's really not, you know, worthy of being seen as, as great poetry. And the same thing with, with you know, with, with black people, uh, black poets, and, you know, I'm just a number of other of groups like that that have just discovered their voices and the overwhelming you know, the overriding academic structure saying, no, that's not, I mean, we, we know what is good poetry, and it's these white men, you know, who are the ones that can do it. So it's very parallel to a number of right. other situations. And in this case, white hearing men. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a really great, great parallel to make, it's true. Um, so you weren't aware of that, and no. <laughs> when, um, had you used interpreters before? Because even before the ASL poets sort of, there were deaf poets, there were some interpretive performances around. We I'm did. not remembering if you used them before. Yes, the deaf yes. Poets. Whenever we would have a large, well-known writer, um, we would get an interpreter to interpret for the deaf. Um, and, you know, we may not have that large an audience that would, that would come, but, um, you know, if there were two or three or four people, then, you know, they were able to have the experience of, of you know, that writer and, and whatever they were saying or reading from. So we did, you know, we did have interpreters prior to um, the, you know, the deaf poetry uh, movement uh, here. And I, I mean, even at that time, I remember, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the interpreters as they were interpreting and just sort of saying, wow, you know, that's really interesting to watch, you know, and you kind of would hear, and especially if it was, you know, like if there was a word like fuck, you know, and so like, everybody in the audience, you know, would, would, their eyes would go, how are they going to interpret that, you know? Uh, so it was, you know, so there was that, I mean, I mean, nobody, I mean, I sort of didn't put a, the two and two together to say, well, you know, that would be wonderful as a separate kind of thing. It was just that it was curious to see how, you know, the spoken language was interpreted through the deaf. And that was really my first experience was through interpreters who were interpreting something that I was, you know, hearing from a hearing you know, writer of some kind. Mm -hmm. Did you ever, um, <clears throat> did you feel from you, from this whole experience that you understood more about the culture of the deaf in any sense? Like you were getting a read on the language and that it was beautiful and it was interesting to listen to like somebody voice it and all that kind of sense. Did mm -hmm. you feel like it, did you got any more of the sensibility of what deafness was or what the oppression was or any of those sorts of issues? Than any well, of that yeah, I mean, I, I, as a result of it, I mean, there were a couple of things. I remember, um, through, you know, through Peter and, 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 you know, through Kenny, I mean, getting a sense of how difficult it was for somebody who had been deaf since birth to kind of learn to kind of write the English language, the written language, and have a sense of the grammar and things like that. And it just sort of made me think, well, yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, you're, you learn the language first, you know, as you're growing up by hearing it. It's only when you get to be, what, five or six years old that you're suddenly starting to write, but you have this whole background of, you know, how things are said and the grammar of it. And, I, and, I, and so suddenly I had that, you know, experience of saying, boy, that must be difficult. Can you imagine coming across a language that, so, you know, suddenly you have to write it out and you have nothing really that's prior to that. Um, so I did have a sense of that. And then I also had, as a result of it, the sense of, the feeling within the deaf community that, you know, this is our own community and it's not as if it is, it's not as if we're, we're less than everybody else because we cannot hear uh, and speak the language and that this language, this American Sign Language is our own language 
that we want to embrace as, as our language. And even if, and this was kind of you know, the first time of hearing and thinking about this, even if cochlear implants were available, you know, to say, no, um, you know, this experience is its own true experience within this deaf community, and that, that is enough. It shouldn't be that you have to then, you know, try to make somebody like the hearing community. So I, I you know, as a result of it, yes, I mean, I, I, you know, all these kinds of issues were ones that were spoken about, that I was, you know, kind of thinking about and hearing about from, from deaf people or from hearing people who were, you know, uh, at NTID who were, you know, the person who were the interpreter. So, yeah, suddenly it, it was like a whole culture that I was unaware of and the issues of being part of that culture started to be, come forward to me and get, a, get an understanding of it, yeah. Yeah, the timing of it is really interesting because right around then is when the Deaf President Now stuff was going on at Gallaudet and all this sort of like Deaf Pride stuff was happening mm -hmm. and this thing of ASL, you know, we, we, like a banner. Yeah. The reason it all happened at the same time, Jim Cohn kind of describes it as a perfect storm. It's like it's uh -huh. the right place, the right time, the right people, the right energy, the right political moment, yes. the right yeah. coalescence of all those things and this understanding that, you know, our language is is a language which yeah. had been linguistically verified by some researchers at Gallaudet, like 65, 66, but took, took a while to percolate out, uh -huh. you know. And then all these students who are from schools for the deaf or mainstream schools from around the country are coming together in this place. And it was like a slam in itself being in this community with so many deaf people. It's like all this mm -hmm. creative energy in one place. Yeah. So. The other thing I remember, which <coughs> funny about that time, which I thought was so interesting, was the idea that the French used ASL where the English in England did not. And so that there was an, a better ability for, you know, deaf Americans who understood ASL to communicate with the French who were doing, a, as opposed to the English which were doing like the spelling out of letters. You know, and I was thinking, well, that's interesting. Like here's this communication that goes on better than, I mean, for us to speak to French people, hearing people like, oh, you have to learn French or they have to learn English. But, you know, the British, we can always speak with the British, even with their funny accents. But the idea of, of American deaf being able to, to speak, like, immediately with, with the French deaf was kind of a fascinating kind of thing for me. Right. Just a little, you know, right. tidbit that kind That's of... That's almost right. There's almost, but not. Almost right, but not <coughs> quite. What happened was that ASL, um, what happened was that there was a French educator. There was the first schools for the deaf in the entire world were in France. Uh -huh. And Gallaudet, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, or way, way back. Okay had yeah. gone over to France to learn methods, brought a deaf man from there over here, started the first school for the deaf in America, in Connecticut. And then all the kids who had their own sort of signs and home signs and their own regional things came there, took what they already had, and then this French guy taught them some stuff that got French language, French sign language oh. mixed in with it. Uh -huh. So the reason that they can communicate so well isn't because it's exactly the same, but there's a lot of French sign language in ASL. Oh, okay. So it's not exactly the same. So you're, yeah. you're very, very close, but it's, it's not like it's exactly the same, but there's so many signs that are similar. And the grammar is very similar, mm -hmm. that it is a much more immediate ability to communicate than British sign language and a lot of other sign languages around the world because they're different in every country. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you brought up cochlear implants, which is a big, big hot topic. Which is something I never would have even, you know, known about or, or thought about without having this experience with deaf poetry. Right. I, uh, basically everything you said was exactly what I needed. I can't really think of anything else unless there's anything else you'd like to add about any of it at all. Anything that comes to mind that you'd like to. You said some wonderful things I'm going to pull out already, but anything else you'd like uh, to add? No, I mean, it's just, you know, I remember just that loss. Um, actually when, when Peter moved away and just uh, kind of thinking, wow, this is, I mean, this is, was something which was so wonderfully of this area and of this community and then, you know, without having the continuation ongoing on a regular basis uh, with flying words was just, I remember just feeling that very personally as a, as a big loss and, and a loss for the whole overall kind of poetry community in Rochester. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever they get together and do it again, I'm always you know, excited about that. Mm -hmm. They'll be in town in February doing a show at NTID. And there is a deaf guy in town named Jeremy Koroga, just moved out a few years ago from Seattle, uh -huh. who has an open a, a deaf poetry series, an open mic series, first Saturday of every month over at Jitters in Southtown. 
Mm. So he's trying to get it going again. He's got a group called the Preservers, and uh-huh. it's sign language preservation. And he's trying to get a deaf poetry scene going again. He's having a lot of trouble. Really? A lot of trouble getting it going. And yeah. um, mm-hmm. I should put him in touch with you. You Maybe should. Maybe some yeah. way you could help him out. Oh, he's, yeah. He had a gallery, a studio space over on University, down the end of the street, down way down where it becomes channel, whatever it is down there. Right. Um, and he was putting out a lot of money and not able to get a lot back, so now Jitters is running their stage and he's doing that once in a while. But I'll, I'll put you guys in touch. Please, because you know, we, we would love to, you know, Wonderful. to have it here. Right. And, uh, you know, there's already, a, there's a big audience of people, mm-hmm. you know, who remember that and, and are looking for more of it, so, Great. yes. Great. Thank you so sure. much. Wonderful. That's exactly what I needed. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Bill. Would, would it help to uh, ask number one again, because of the noise problem? That's a long thing to have to say again, but if, uh, do you think we need it? Was it that distracting? Can you do it, Joe? That whole... That whole... I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> if you can, that'd be if great. You mean, you have to go on the word now, obviously. Yeah, right. But it had a flow, if you remember how you began, <coughs> and Jim, and then mm-hmm. and how, and then the banquet, and all that right. kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks, It'd be great. <laughs> That's where a lot of the meat was, too. Yeah. So. Uh, it was just how it all began and who, who approached you first with have, were you aware of the deaf community in Rochester and how did it happen that you got sort of drawn into this whole deaf community? Yeah, well, I mean, I was aware that there was a deaf community and just aware of it because of Rochester being what Rochester is and there's always deaf people around no matter where you go. You know, you can be at the public market, you can be at a restaurant, you can be, you know, at a bar with the game on or something and there's going to be deaf people around. And it's just, I mean, I, I think it was one of the one really wonderful things about Rochester and kind of adds a certain kind of, you know, something that other communities don't have. Um, so I was aware of that. I wasn't really aware that there was a deaf, you know, uh, poetry uh, going on at all. Um, but I think the connection was made. There were a number of people like, like Jim Cohn, um, Wendy Lowe, who were themselves, you know, hearing uh, uh, writers, poets, uh, who were at Writers and Books doing readings and, and uh, but were also out at NTID um, as interpreters. So they, and, and at that time, we had just moved into this building in 1985, and it was, suddenly we had a lot more space than we had had before. Before we had one room, so if we had a class or a workshop, you couldn't have a reading. <laughs> and so you could do one thing at a time. But when we moved in here, we could have, you know, with three floors, we could have two or three or four classes going on and uh, a, a poetry reading or, or, or some other kind of performance. So suddenly we were able to have a lot more things going on. And it was a time when there was, um, it was a really active time of people kind of discovering poetry and, and, and kind of writing it and wanting to perform it. I mean, it was going from much more of a, you know, you'd be the written poem to there was a real sense now of, of performance of poetry. And um, so, there was that connection that was made, um, you know, through Jim or, or through Wendy of, of, you know, there was this beginning of deaf poetry and to have it, you know, like uh, uh, take place here. Um, and also there was Jazzberries, which was another place. And so there were, you know, readings and things going on. Um, but, uh, you know, who, whoever it was, Jim or Wendy, you know, there was a, you know, some a deaf poetry of, uh, evening done here. And I remember at the time just um, being really amazed at, you know, by it and saying, wow, this is really unique. And I, I was aware of poetry all around the country and various movements going on, you know, the beginning of poetry slams in Chicago, uh, language poetry going on um, out in, uh, in San Francisco and in LA, and, and even uh, cowboy poetry, you know, out in Montana and places like that. So there was some very, things that were very unique to specific places. It was a certain kind of New York City kind of performance poetry going on. <clears throat> so I knew what was going on and seeing this, I said, you know, this is, this, this is not happening anywhere else. This is completely unique to Rochester and it's really wonderful. I mean, it, 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 it could, it happens, it's happening here because there is a deaf community uh, that exists of the size that it does. and. Not only was there the, I mean, what, what, even beyond the uniqueness of seeing deaf poetry performed uh, with American Sign Language, and even more of a kind of a body movement, there was the other aspect of it, which was having it 
interpreted for the hearing. And the two of them together made it even more unique for me. And I thought, this is wonderful. This is, this is great. It's, it's, it's something that's grown out of here. This is our own thing in Rochester. And it should get a, a larger audience outside of here. And I remember the opportunity came along. We had a conference here, which was in, I don't know, 1985, 86, something like that. And we had people from around the state, and it was done in collaboration with New York State Council on the Arts. And so when we had the people there, we wanted, you know, we had them here for two days, two or three days. And we wanted to introduce them to things that were unique to Rochester. So we had a lunch, and we had White Hots, you know, so they could kind of, you know, what's a White Hot? Well, you know, here's a White Hot. And we, uh, <coughs> and we had Genesee beer for them to drink. Okay, here's, you know. Um, and then the other thing was we had a dinner that we held at City Hall. So we wanted them to see, you know, this architecture, this wonderful architecture, City Hall, and beautiful old building restored. And I thought that would be a great opportunity to have them see deaf poetry. But I didn't say to anybody it was deaf poetry. What I said was that you'll be hearing some local poets before dinner. And I remember people saying, oh, boy, we got to listen to the local poets. You know, can't we just eat, you know? <laughs> um, so before the dinner, I went up and I said, and I, you know, said to people, you know, you're visiting Rochester, many of you, for the first time. One of the really unique things about Rochester is that we have the highest per capita deaf community in the entire country here. So as you go around Rochester, you will see people, deaf people, signing. And it's a wonderful thing you know, sorry, that makes it a unique community. And, I, and also, there is a kind of poetry that's grown up out of this that I would like you to experience. So I introduced, um, it was Kenny and, and Peter, um, and Debbie Rennie, and they performed, and, and the people there were, I mean, these were publishers from New York and poets and, and arts administrators, uh, and they were just blown away by it. It's like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And uh, one of the people there was Gregory Kalavakis, and, and Gregory was the head of the New York State Council of the Arts Literature Program. Uh, wonderful person. Um, the, the first person I actually knew personally who had died of AIDS, which was a great loss. But he, he was very forward-thinking and, and really uh, immediately saw what was wonderful and great about this deaf poetry. And afterwards came up and said, this, thank you for introducing. This is, this is wonderful. People throughout the state of New York have to see about this. And he talked to, to Kenny and Peter. Um, and as a result of that, um, he arranged for funding for them to tour. Uh, throughout the United States, I mean, and, and, and throughout New York State, they did also other places throughout the United States, but throughout New York State to introduce deaf poetry to audiences around, around New York. And I, I mean, that first thing of, of, yes, this is good, people can recognize it here, how unique and wonderful it is, but also people from around the country and the state to recognize it and to get out and to reach audiences with that. Um, so that's, that's my first memory of, you know, how it happened and how to kind of how it went to a kind of a next stage. Great. That was almost, that was, that was almost everything. Um, the only other thing I wanted to ask um, was you did bring Ginsburg in, it yes. seemed to me. Uh, yes. One, twice. That twice, yes. Uh-huh. Because uh, one time I interpreted, one time Cindy Barrett interpreted. I remember uh -huh. going to dinner. Did he ever mention anything about his experience with when he had done that workshop with Bob Panera, there was this incredible workshop that he did where he met with a deaf poet uh, before Peter and Kenny got going, before Debbie got going. Uh -huh. It's kind of a seminal moment for deaf poetry when they had this sort of workshop. And he said it made a big impression on him, and he yeah. told me about that. Did he mention anything like yeah, that? Yeah, he did. I remember him, him, him the same thing, that it was just kind of a realization that there is a whole other language out there for poetry that he was unaware of. And, um, and, and that you know, the signing of American Sign Language. Um, I mean, at that time, it was, I mean, what he was seeing being signed was, you know, basically, it was just a signing of kind of what would be a basic sort of poetry. I mean, it wasn't poetry that was designed for American Sign Language uh, that much. Um, but I remember him being very impressed by it and thinking, you know, this is, yeah, I mean, there's something really unique about this. Um, yeah, I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks sure. for going through that sure. all again. It was all right. great. One more thing. Can I yeah. you spelling your name? Yes. Ask for the camera. Oh, you want me to just do it for the camera? Yes, please. Okay. Joe Flaherty, F L 
A H E R T Y. And you are the Executive Director of Writers and Books. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. So thanks for your time and giving us the space. Sure. And have Wendy come in and then we'll turn it all down and get out. What I'm going to ask you to begin with is back in the time of which we're speaking in the 80s things started to happen to be changing in terms of what ASL was and whether there was even this thing called poetry. And as you know, there was tension about whether people would even, deaf people would even call it poetry. So just anywhere you want to start talking about where you were at and what you saw and how you got involved with the whole scene. Well, I um, walked into the deaf community fairly naive and I was an English teacher and a poet. And um, so I was an English teacher and a poet um, trying to understand the deaf community. So the moment was really right for me because I think there were a couple of moments that made me decide that even though I really struggled with sign language, sign language did not come easily to me, that it would be possible for me to continue on this road I had set instead of just withdraw and become a teacher with hearing students. And one of those moments happened early on when I was a communications counselor and I was sitting in an office with a kid and that moment came at the end of the conference when we'd done everything we were supposed to do and the kid was still sitting there. And I started to tell about how I, why I love the snow, especially really cold, snowy days. And about how if you're out in Rochester by yourself, you feel really alone and there's no one out and it's really cold and you feel really brave and alone. And then you see somebody coming from a distance. And you can't see them. It's kind of hazy because of all the snow. And then there comes a moment when it all clears up. And it's like there's a, a glass bowl over you. And the two of you are alone together. And it's like you, you know, you just kind of nod at each other. And you're the two, you're the only people in the world, you know. And, then you go back. and I was able to tell that. And for the first time, I felt like myself in the language. As a person who is articulate and says things poetically. And it was even better in sign language than I could have ever made it in English because of the spatial relations and the visual nature of what I was trying to communicate. And so that said, after that moment, I remember this huge feeling of relief. You can be yourself in this new language. And then, I was, I got to know some fr people and I didn't know Jim very well and Jim had this idea that he was going to do something with deaf poetry and he was talking to me about it and I said, oh, I know somebody else who's interested in it. It might even have been Kenny. And I said, oh, and, and, and Jim was like, well, if they're interested in it, why aren't they doing something with it? <laughs> and I thought, this guy's interesting. <laughs> so um, when Jim started organizing to have the conference, we were friends by that point through the poetry community because he was writing English language poetry and publishing Action Magazine. and um, I had started to have some deaf friends because there was this sign language poetry thing happening. I, I mean, this happened gradually through all of this. And, and because I had something in common with somebody who did poetry. It was not an artificial attempt to have a friendship. And Jim came to me one day and he was really frustrated and he said, everybody's giving me a hard time, everybody has a different idea of how to do this and then they don't show up to meetings and da 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 da. And I said, to, and I think he was meeting with Debbie and Peter and Patrick Grayville and there might have been one other person. And I said, Jim, you want this so badly, but it isn't yours. It's the deaf people's. So you have to call their bluff. You have to say, I want to do this, but I'm not, I can't do this alone. So if you're not supporting me, because they were all like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know? And when he finally said, what are we going to do? This is yours. If you're not doing it, if you're not interested, even though this has been the whole reason why I learned sign language, it isn't happening. Then it started to go. And I thought that was, you know, a big moment because 
he is a very visionary person and a, um, a hard-working person, and he was going to make it happen, but he needed to make sure he had buy-in. Are you speaking of the times of like jazz berries and getting the painted rope thing going with powder? Are you already? I'm talking about the conference. The conference. Which the was conference seven. itself. Okay. Yes. Okay. In deciding to do the conference. You to put that on. Yeah. yeah. Because that was pretty major okay. effort. It took collaboration among a lot of people. Yeah. How about before that, when um, he and Todd put together the painted rope series or frayed rope series? I can't remember. Painted rope. Painted rope series, where he was bringing interpreters in to show the deaf people the hearing poetry and then started incorporating them. Were you? I know that. Yeah, you read, I was one I of the readers. I was one of the hearing readers, and um, I think that might have been the time Donna interpreted for me. And um, I, have, I really, there are a few people who were interpreters who really were wonderful poetry interpreters because they understood what they were interpreting. And they got, I think, to be very, very good interpreters by being able to be so flexible with the way language works in poetry. Um, and I was really, I felt really privileged to see their work. Um, so when there would be big, really important poets like Allen Ginsberg in town, to see them interpreted by really good interpreters really expanded my idea of how sign language could help, could work, you know. And, and the same thing the other way around. I was not good enough at that point in watching sign language to necessarily get it all without a voice interpreter. Nowadays, I really wish there were no voice interpreters, but I understand that not everybody, you know what I mean? But at that point, I really needed the voice interpreters. And the other thing that made it possible for me to learn sign language, and I've since learned that this is, this is how I learned, I look back, this is how I learned Spanish, if I learn French better, this is how I'll learn French. I had to look at the poetry because for me, I may be a little ADD, I get bored easily. So watching people talk about what they're going to have to on lunch, for lunch on a videotape just doesn't do it for me. It's not, it's not um, meaty enough language to watch again and again and try and get the language out of. But watching, I would watch Clayton Valley's stuff, I would watch Patrick's stuff, I would watch Tebby's stuff over and over and over again until I understood every little nuance. And you know, the, the 50th time through I'd see something I hadn't seen. I had to watch it again and again and again. And I could do that because of videotape. And, and it really enriched my, my American Sign Language enormously because I memorized those poems. It gave me it gave me a repertoire of moves in the language that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. So you felt like you even got better at, that's a really interesting way to look at it, you learn the language by looking at the poetry and the poetic constructs of how the language works. Yeah, because it breaks it down and it's so, it's so distilled. Right, right. It gives you more of an idea of the everyday and the mundane to look at the metaphor and all that. That's cool. Well, and just even the, 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 the grammatical structure is there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying I didn't have to do a lot of other things to learn the language, but that's, that's where the real joy in learning it other than in conversation with real people was. Did you, were you aware of um, the tension at the time about whether what, what these people, what Debbie and what Peter and what oh, Patrick God, and yes. people, what, whether it was really called poetry or not? Yeah. And you could talk a little bit about that. Well, the poets never had any real question about it, I think, in certain ways. I mean, the deaf people didn't, there was this kind of thing, well, there was a, there was a kind of a resistance to poetry because poetry had always been the enemy in English class. It's the stuff you don't understand because it's based on English. And then, um, and the desire to call what we do something different. Then there were the people, the same people, I think there was some resistance from the people who were like, is ASL a language? Is this poetry? Is this really poetry? It, it was not major out there, but it was kind of like, this can't be the, this can't be the equivalent of English poetry. I mean, it doesn't have 
you know, millennia of heritage in it. Well, bullshit, but you know, I mean, because most of the people doing it were bilingual and it had a millennia of heritage from that and it had um, a history within the deaf community too. Just because we didn't have record, records of most of that doesn't mean it didn't exist. So I never, I never had a lot of patience for that argument. What was interesting to me was the um, purist view versus what Peter and Kenny and Debbie are doing is not poetry, but what Clayton Valley is doing is poetry. And when I did my thing about duets, I got in trouble because my example was Peter and Debbie. And they said, yeah, well, that's very interesting, but that's not poetry. And I said two things. First of all, I think it is poetry. I think it's performance poetry. It's just a different kind of poetry than the sonnet. Mm -hmm. You know, yours may be a sonnet and this is a performance poem. Okay. Secondly, I may have the wrong example to prove it to you, but I think my duet theory is still right with any example. You know, and the theory was basically that the same rules that apply, they, the, the linguists had come up with this stuff about how you use your hands in sign language. You have to use them doing the same thing simultaneously, doing opposite things, or um, one has to stay still while the other moves. I think those were the three. And I, sh I was trying to show that when you do a duet, for the same visual reasons that the audience can't take it in any other way, you either have to pass the movement on, you stop and I start, or you have to be doing the same parallel thing that I'm doing or the opposite thing that I'm doing. Or then it turns into a dialogue interaction, but that's stop, start, stop, start too. So that was kind of my theory, but it was being, people were like being skeptical about it because it was Peter and Debbie doing something that looked like acting. And is this resistance coming from the deaf community or the hearing community? Do you know, I think it's coming from the legitimacy issue. Mm -hmm. everything, we, everything that is done around ASL in that time was a, was a bid for legitimacy. For the language? For the language, exactly. So if it was going to be a legitimate language, it had to have a literature. And then, of course, the argument is, what's the canon? What's legitimate literature? And if it doesn't look like Robert Frost, are we going to get legitimacy for it? Now, interestingly, I don't think Clayton was the heavy hitter on that one. I mean, Clayton, I think, was pretty accepting, but he was questioning, you know? And I think Clayton Valley, I think the world of Clayton Valley, I think he's an amazing spirit. And you know, so I don't, but he was questioning it and it was mainly, was it the Supalas or I can't remember. There was a, there were a couple of people who were born deaf of deaf families who were really like trying to say, this is my trademark. This is, this is, this is what it is because this is what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt, and, and so there was questions about, well, Peter hadn't grown up with sign language. That was an issue. And neither had Debbie. And neither had Debbie. So how could what they be doing? The question wasn't, and I as a hearing person who, who knew a, a modicum of sign language, my question, I, th I, th I think their question wasn't so much was it poetry, but was it ASL? Because to me it was poetry. There's a, a book called Make, Strike a Blow and Die, the story of the John Chilembwe uprising, and I think it's in Malawi or something, it's in Pidgin English. There are times when you can't even understand what he's saying, but it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, and I, I, I challenge anybody to say just because it's not a perfect example of native speaking of English that it isn't a great work of literature. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. It's, it's like, Emily Dickinson says, how do I know it's poetry? If the top of my head comes off, it's poetry. And, you know, the rest I leave to the linguistics people. Mm -hmm. And talk a lot of people's heads are coming off back then from the yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of hot debates about it. Did you, um, 
Well, do, so go a little bit more into your uh, duets, a little bit more about that. Well, it basically, it was, I, I, think, I think it was that I was fascinated that you could do a duet. I, I was seeing this happening in performance poetry in English, where people would be talking over each other. I'd be talking and Todd Beers would be talking at the same time. And sometimes that worked, but mostly it didn't. And so I was interested in what do you really have to do to have a good duet? And I think I, think I would argue that the stuff that was crossover where people were talking over each other, where I'm reading one poem and he's reading another poem simultaneously, it has musical interest, but it's not, it, it's not accessible poetry, it's language poetry. Language poetry where you're playing with how language works. And not, I'm not saying that's not poetry, but I think that in most duets there are some rules about how you get something across so that the audience can actually take it in or take it in. And so what you saw, I'm, I'm assuming that the one you're talking about is psychotic memory. I think so, yeah. Hamburger, splat. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. that one. Um, did you also look at, um, there was uh, the, the, Quebec, the poet from Quebec who came down, Johanna and Serge. I did see them. But I don't that remember. wasn't part of your work, was it? Because they did do a thing where they did a beautiful nature scene that was like a duet also that I don't I know. I think I looked at that too, but I didn't use it as my example. Okay. It would be another one. I mean, there were. I was. I was drawing conclusions from a very small set of yeah. examples, there wasn't which is. Much going on. Yeah, in duets, there right. wasn't a lot. Right. right. I know that NTD did stuff where there were group homes where they created mm -hmm. images and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but it wasn't a sustained. Uh, it wasn't a sustained thing that you're talking about that took a, it took a thing. Right, and I don't. I don't. I haven't seen a lot since. Yeah, no, I mean, the the breakup of of the Debbie Peter team was a was a big blow, because mm -hmm. they were doing really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Peter and Kenny do a piece called um, E equals MC squared. Yes, I've seen that. That I don't know if it would fit or not because they create so many things that are the image only comes by both of them being part of it, not by playing off of each other. Like right. Well, that. and there you've got another factor. What you've got is tableau. Oh, right, right. That's another thing you can do in a duet. You can stop the frame and give us a tableau picture, and then some part of it can move ever so slightly, but it, it, it's not like you're both saying different things. Mm -hmm. Does it extend, so a tableau would also extend to, well, there's, there's Serge and Johanna and Peter and Kenny doing the Holocaust piece, and there are several parts of that. I haven't seen any of this stuff in so long. Uh, it's, okay. it's hard for yeah. me to remember. That's why I wanted to get you to sample DVD. Oh, yeah. And I remember Kenny having this trouble, too. You know, we would run it up the flagpole as an as an elective, mm -hmm. and not always get a class. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what? Yep. Um. And I remember one time I had I had Debbie doing a class, and I wanted to get a lot of people in to see her. She was going to teach how to how to create poems in sign language and teach about transformations and all of this other stuff, all this wonderful stuff. And I finally figured out, because I'd had somebody else, I might have had Peter doing a, a workshop, and very few people showed up. I started charging for it. You know? And the fact that you had to pay $5 to be in it meant that people realized it might be worth something. <laughs> you know? It's just, it's just funny how that is. <laughs> you had takers when they had to pay. <laughs> right. And do you remember there was down in the basement, there was a little pub-like restaurant, and there was a, was it a weekly or a monthly? This was before I got Showcase. the cellar. Yeah, if you could talk about that, because I wasn't there yet, so well, I would love you to talk about that. that was the there was like an room. open mic where, no microphone, but you know, where people would perform, and that's where Eddie Swayze really first started performing and doing anything. And there were a couple of other people, and Rita Straubhauer did a couple of really nice pieces, Susan did some pieces, just um, John Nathaniel, um, whose name is escaping me, Everybody, people who had an inkling towards that kind of, you know, they were kind of interested, tried things. And there were many things, I mean, you, you see this in, in English language poetry. You'll get um, people who in their early 20s write three or four really nice poems, but 
it's not their life and they never write anything again. But because there was this venue where you could, sh you could try it and show it off, people were trying to compose stuff who had never tried before and it was really lots of fun. And Patrick would, I think they would have a feature person from time to time or maybe every time and Patrick would go down and do stuff. And one of the things that kind of disappointed me over the years was that people would get a repertoire and then they would freeze it. And, and this happens, I think, a lot with performance poetry because, and it's not just in the deaf world, because you get a certain audience reaction and you're going in front of different audiences all the time. So you don't really need a new repertoire mm -hmm. unless you're writing this stuff for yourself. And so a um, brilliant poet like, like Patrick has a very small oof. I don't know how you say that, that French word that means your body of work. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's kind of interesting because what happened was people developed stuff really early on, a lot of stuff, and then they just kind of had it. And, and they had their explanation for it. And I think it suffered some from being studied, from being an academic topic so early on rather than uh, just an organic community art. Because it was an academic subject, because it was being looked at so closely, people were maybe not as experimental as they would have been, with, you know, with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I know Peter and Kenny work hard to keep doing stuff, and Debbie considers herself, although she's teaching and she's doing a lot of other stuff in Sweden, she still considers herself primarily a poet now, so she's still very active. But Patrick told me, I'm tired, I don't really do stuff anymore, um, who's next? And yeah. Ella does just sporadic stuff, like I said, in the service of her But I'm not even talking about in the long run, I'm talking about people produced, and maybe some of them had one, one in, in they had written one poem, you know? They'd written one poem mm -hmm. and maybe it had gotten some play along the way and they'd forgotten about it and then when this whole thing of deaf poetry came up, they l released that mm -hmm. poem mm -hmm. and people said, oh, ah, you know, that's wonderful. And then they maybe made five more, enough for a set. Right. They made up, they put together a set and that was their set. Then the, then and then, then that became one videotape and that was kind of... And, and of course, also, who's next was a big issue. I mean, if there had been a real rush for a next generation right then and there, it would have been great. Mm -hmm. But not. Not really. Yeah, not really. Jeremy Kuroga, do you know him? No, I don't. That young guy, nice, nice guy, very talented, is trying to get things going again in Rochester, not having a whole lot of luck. But Joe said, send him over. And he yeah. well, and trying to do a series. Well, and the other thing is, I think that the videotapes mm -hmm. also had an influence. Mm -hmm. They became the frozen, here it is, here's the videotape. You don't need a live poet, you've got, oh, but no, no, the other way around. The other way around. Some people had the videotapes, and then the schools for the deaf, they were so expensive at first. So the kids weren't growing up with it. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very important point, is that, and what I'm hoping some of this will do is also, like, give curriculum, like you make kids study English poetry in school and recite it and learn it and they hate it, but you don't give them anything their language is generated well, as a poetic form. So why would they think that they can create poetry in their own language when they have no role models in their own play? Well, and for translating English poetry and not only, you know, not to give, a, not just to give an ASL equivalent, but to say, okay, something is happening in this poem that the hearing person is noticing and that's all these thin sounds, these e's and is, that's that's like if you only used, you know, lines rather than whole hands. Whole hands are more like O's and ah's. When you're teaching English and you're teaching poetry, you can say, okay, this poem has a relaxed feel, like as if the hands were always open. It's really it's you know, poetry is hard to explain as it is. Mm -hmm. But to have some kind of a an equivalent and to be able to say it's, it's like this. How would you, when you were teaching it, well, that, that was great what you were just showing me. Are there any other things like that that you were showing when you had to do demonstrations of rhythm or rhyme or 
any of those kinds of grammatical features that can apply to ASL in its own way, what were the sort of things that you would do if you remember? There is one thing I remember, and it isn't really related exactly to ASL. <laughs> But there's a, a poem by Dickinson that um, has the great line, it's about a, uh, a snake. And you don't know, a narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have seen him if you did his notice sudden is. And then you go down, 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 down. I, I never see this fellow attended or alone without a, a shorter breathing or something like that and zero at the bone. And zero at the bone, just, just saying it makes you go, <laughs> and I had to say, well, you know, coldness wouldn't do it. It's the sound that does it, and you can see it in the lip reading. Mm. So you have to have some visual equivalent if you're going to get this across. In lip reading, you can see that, that tension of that E and that, you know. You can see it. It's got to do with your visceral reaction to what you physically do when you say zero. Mm. So just being aware of American Sign Language poetry and how the kids could get a visual equivalent. And of course, I'm sure you're going to talk about this. ASL does something that uh, any hearing person who knows it is really jealous of, and that's those transformations. I mean, you're going to have something about that, right? Yeah, but I want to hear from you. OK, well, in English, you can have a pun, and you can have a metaphor. And a metaphor is when you say something is something, and you know, but you have to kind of say both things. Or don't, maybe you don't. You say, water your hair with our hair tonic. You know, you're saying hair is grass, but, and it's kind of hidden. But the best, the best example of transformation, I think, is in Debbie's poem where throwing paint on the sky becomes fireworks, becomes ASL. And so it's, at one point, it's a pun, where this means fireworks and ASL at the same time. It's a pun. But they're each transforming into each other. And the implication of the pun is that all of these things are the same. ASL is fireworks, ASL is color on the sky, ASL is expression. And to have all those things happening at once, well, I just drool to be able to do that. You know, that's that, that, it, every language has its own poetic virtues that another language doesn't have. Which is why it's kind of sad that so many languages are dying off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All those, those treasures. Um, I don't, I'm not going to have a chance to ask many people this, so I'm really glad that I get you, um, because you not only um, know sign very well, but you were a hearing poet and utilized the service of interpreters to entrust us with getting your poetry out to the Oh, audiences. and it was so much fun. And it was a kick-ass experience. And I wonder if you could be one of my talking heads about the whole process of working with an interpreter to get your... <sighs> God, we were so young and so, I mean, I don't think we slept much back then. And we would get together and the interpreter would spend an hour with the poet, just going over, now what does this line mean, what does this line mean, how do you want it interpreted, and if it had more than one meaning, do we have to do both meanings, and da 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 da, da. And people like you and Donna and uh, Susan would ask such, I mean, such wonderful questions about the poems and make you think more about your own meanings in a way that maybe you hadn't. And, and you had to explain the poem and you're kind of like, um, I think. <laughs> but it was, one, and, and, and it was a poet's dream to have anybody pay that close attention to their poem in front of them. I mean, famous poets, they write their poems, they send them out, and they hope people read them. And if they're really lucky, they're in an anthology or they have a book of their own that somebody reads in a, in, in a class where they actually pay attention to every word and, and really get into it. And to have somebody very intelligent, bilingual, in front of you saying, now what does this mean? And, and getting into it and, and being enthusiastic about it and how am I going to interpret that and translate that? 
it was just so much fun. I mean, it was great ego stroke, too. You know? <laughs> and it was fun to have the interpreter there. For one thing, it allowed you a deaf audience. It allowed me to give access to what I do in poetry to my deaf friends. And at the same time, I mean, you guys were just, I mean, I don't know if anybody was listening to us at all. You know, you were so beautiful up there doing your thing, and they were just like, that's, that's amazing. You know, it made it so much more, it, it gave more dimension to the whole thing. And you chose not to sign the stuff yourself. Was oh, that God, ever? you can't sign the stuff yourself. No, I, um, I actually, I never was good enough. I mean, that's not entirely true. If I wrote a poem in sign language, which I did write a few, I did compose a few, um, I would perform it in sign language. Um, but um, I, I, was, I was not necessarily good enough to develop my own translation, nor am I a beautiful enough signer, and nor am I smooth enough to really feel confident that I would be doing the poem justice the other thing I wanted to say is um, Stacy Lawrence and I have been t teaching in the summer. We teach for the last two years a class in American Sign Language for Kids through stories and poetry. And I just really feel like this is the way to learn. Now, I'm, I know there are different kinds of brains. There are analytical brains who have to learn all the structure, et cetera, et cetera. But if they're like me, having something meaty like poetry to memorize, to express, starts to teach you the grammar, starts to teach you all of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you need a human being that you need to converse with or you'll never learn the language. Mm -hmm. It's a very cool guy. Um, and that stuff probably came up more in the Lit Conference in 91, I think, because all kinds of fireworks went off in 91. That was just a whole, fortunately I'm not getting into any of that at all. I'm sticking with poetry, not lit, and I'm sticking with this particular time period and everything leading up to it. Mm -hmm. And then if anybody wants to do all that other shit, they can be my guest. But but my main thing, I mean, just to get, let you know, I've already interviewed Ella, Bernard Bragg, Panera, Patrick Rabel, I got Kenny, I'm going to get Peter, I'm going to get Peter and Kenny. Uh, Good and Valley's gone, unfortunately, but I have some old footage of interviews with him. And some old, and old Dorothy Miles. Now, are you familiar with her stuff at all? I remember seeing it. Okay, but you're not really... Why? What were you going to... Oh, I, I'm just actually getting the litany of who... It's all the stuff leading up to the stuff mm -hmm. that happened here in Rochester mm -hmm. and the fact that Ella and Clayton were sort of independent, Out there spontaneously com, you know, combusting. generated, you know... And, and, and somebody could have been... Some, in 1950, somebody could have been... Somebody was somewhere, yeah. But yeah. they weren't brought together. There was no way to know. Yeah, because there, there was no way to know, and there was no um, gathering. Right. And, and Jim was really the catalyst. And Jim was the catalyst. And Jim um, is just an exceptional human being that way. He's just always doing the next thing that takes poetry to another level. Right. And right. Ella and Clayton actually ended up meeting, hurrying about each other and arranging a meeting simply so they could meet because they heard, I heard you doing poetry, I'm doing it too. They found each other, but it was very serendipitous. Um, Clayton, Clayton, I, you know, I'm not sure I've seen everything that was ever recorded of Clayton. I need to go and, oh, yeah. and check it out. It will lend fuel to your fire about the frozen aspect because one of the things that happened with him, this won't go on here either, is that his stuff is absolutely beautiful and his hands and the way he does it. But he performed it over and over and over so many times it became frozen in his delivery. He would but he, do things well, he, to do he, it. He believed in that, though. He would he do believed, it. So that there was hardly any pauses. Well, you know, it's interesting because there's this debate in the storytelling community about whether you do a poem, whether you do a, there are people who make a lot of money doing a story with exactly the same intonations over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who say that's not storytelling. Storytelling, you respond with your audience, et cetera, et cetera, and you change it according to the occasion. And certainly, and what, what in freezing the way you deliver it, you are making it like paper. Well, but you can and 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 um, Lois, Lois Bragg was it? Lois, yeah. She argued that the American Sign Language community's storytelling and poetry was like in the old days in England, 
Anglo-Saxon language, there was no way to write it down. And there were these traveling troubadours who would, who would gather a circle of people around, and then things that people asked for and things that people said influenced the performance. And, but, and then there was the Latin literature that was high culture and was written down on paper, and it was in a book, and therefore it was valorized as better. And I think some people, like Clayton, felt that by freezing it, they had created something the equivalent of page poetry. And I, I, and I don't have a lot against that, but I like oral culture. I like interactive culture, oral in that sense, face-to-face um, -face culture, and the ad adaptivity of that. But it's nice to be able to freeze it on videotape because if it does change, then you'd like to see the next iteration and how it's changed because 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. For instance, you take Patrick Graybill's thing with the space shuttle. I can imagine him creating a new poem where he puts those two together, 9-11, but it's not going to happen because the idea is you do it the same way over and over and over again. And not to get too deep about it, but um, one of the things I really like about Seneca religion is that it's not frozen. Um, at the midwinter ceremony, people are allowed to bring up their dreams and about how the ritual should change. And there's something about being the people of the book as, 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 as Jews and Christians that means that we're not very adaptive. When things are frozen on paper, it's not that flexible, but you know that's that's going to a whole nother. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. That was just, I want to kiss you. That was great. There's so many parts in that that are okay. really perfect. I mean, well, you know, and you might you see. might see Lois that. Bragg came and did her thing about how ASL was the same as the true troubadour. It Robert was the illegitimate, illegitimate, the illegitimate language of the people. But that's so rich. I interrupted you when you said that, and I want you to say that again without me interrupting you. Okay. You might say that again. Okay. Well, Lois Bragg did a presentation where she talked about this, and she talked about how ASL was the illegitimate language of the people, and therefore it was not given the same value as Latin or French. But, you know, that oral culture, that's so rich. That's so, that's where, you know, stuff bubbles up from. And it's so responsive to the moment, you know? So anyway. Um, I guess the only other thing I could ask you, um, boy, you just glazed up to say, is um, did you feel that your own poetry or your own uh, create, creative growth was, furthered by your involvement in this whole thing. I just, you know, I just had the funniest feeling. And that was of a deep sadness because um, I, I, I'd, have, I'd have to think about that. It was a really wonderful time for me and I miss it. Um, a large, when I get together with Stacy and teach, I get in contact with a part of myself that I don't, because I don't have that, other than when I see friends, et cetera, I don't have that much connection. But um, with the deaf community or with sign language anymore, and um, there was a young idealistic poet back then, and I probably created a lot more back then partly because I was part of this community, deaf and hearing together, who felt they were, what they were doing was important. You know, you can often feel as a poet or a writer, putting something on paper, who cares? You know, who's going to look at this? Who's, who cares? And that time was the growth, and we now see this slam poetry and all this other stuff happening with performance poetry. But that was the first time that poets said, let's take it out of the closet and read it. And sure, they, they'd done that with the, in the 50s too, but let's read it and let's see people's reactions face to face. 
And on the one hand, I sometimes felt like I was writing for a very narrow audience and therefore I was limiting my writing. But on the other hand, just the idea that somebody cared. And the idea, you felt like you were, with the sign language poetry stuff, you felt like you were part of something historical happening that had needed to happen up until then and would be needed by posterity. And so, you know, you felt like you were really a part of something. And, and the parties were good. <laughs> you know, we had a good time. We had a really good time. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. Wendy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -mm -mm. All right. I didn't know that was in there. Uh, but, you know, I miss y'all, yeah. you know? Yeah, well, we did have some great times. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly did. It was exciting. And I think that, um, you know, I have this simultaneous thing in me that when I got here, I didn't think, I thought this must be happening everywhere else. I didn't. My body just did not exist. And to have a language that I had to use my body for, now here's a really That's weird story. Thing. I can tell you when I first really realized what this was doing for me. I'm coming around the corner towards the English department. Remember, you used to come out of the Dean's area into the English department, and there's the water fountain there, and I'm walking right by with my, busy, busy with my papers, and I go like this. And it was my body knocking on my head saying, language is the only thing you listen to? I can do language now, and you are thirsty now. Go back to that water fountain because I was really in denial of my body's needs.